when I was first asked to light a fuel, it, I was terrified. Uh, the light meter, the needle kept moving. I couldn't make it stop every time I pointed at the needle. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing here. At the very beginning, when I joined the ABC, I was a driver film assistant. So I drove the cameraman to, to the job, but also recorded sound on either optical or magnetic stripe with Pro 600 cameras. So if, they, if the reporter was doing an interview, the cameraman was shooting it and I would do the, the sound. And all you had to do was keep the needle in a certain segment. So it was pretty easy stuff and they let us do it. I was able to watch cameramen cover all those different facets of life and the different ways to cover it uh, as a cameraman. And so that training ground for seven years at the ABC was absolutely extraordinary because it gave you an asset that was think ahead, think ahead all the time. Think of what you need for the next shot or the next one or the next one. How to light ahead how to stay ahead of your camera. I went to sports, learned how to shoot horse races and, and not fall over because you've got to go around the corner. Uh, car racing, we covered the Bathurst races. All of that was fantastic sort of in the mind, technical way of shooting anything that moved. And as I said, held me in good stead all my life. When I, I loved camera operating, I just, once I fell into that, I couldn't get away from it. I thought that was the best job you could ever get in the world. A lot of the responsibility fell on the operator. So you had to learn very quickly all of the basics of continuity to supply the editor with, with footage that would enable him or her to cut the film the way the director wanted, watching the greats like Russell Boyd, Pete James and, and, and Don McAlpine doing, shooting all those fantastic early films, they were all different. And being an operator for them was fantastic because I could watch each individual uh, individual's approach, how fast they went, how good it was, how it suited the film. All of that was, again, a learning process that was getting me ready for lighting when I finally would take it up. Huh? As you got maybe a familiarity with a director, you understood what he was getting at, what the script was getting at, what the actors were getting at, and you had this freedom of a, the ability to change the focal length. And now that can create and help the emotion of, the, of that shot. And there were many, many shots where, you know, something was happening that you felt, oh, I'd love to just Go in and in and in and in. Take the audience into that emotion, whatever it was. Take them in. Suck them into that that emotion. And the zoom could do it. And it could be it could be seen. I wasn't scared of seeing a zoom because if the audience were going with it, that's what they wanted. That's what their brain wanted. To go, can I see more of that? You know, can I feel more of that? I love that feeling of that flow being correct and keeping the audience's brain uh, settled as to where things were in the darkness around that virtual window. Uh, and I stuck with that. All of that to me was the freedom of the camera to the actors to, to make the film that the director wanted to make. When I was operating, I learned a lot from other DPs in that approach to directors. And I saw them try to argue with a director about how a scene should be shot. The director had a firm idea of how they wanted it and the cameraman had their idea and they argued. And I thought, if I ever become a director of photography, I'm not going to argue because it's their film in a way. I'll try and enhance. I won't try and change. I'll listen. And Sidney Pollack, working with Sidney Pollack, who's a very strong character, he said, you don't talk a lot, do you? I knew what he was getting at, and, and I, I was okay with that. I said, no, but I do a lot of listening, Sidney. When we get out there to shoot the movie, I'll have a few ideas to say, and I'll throw them at you when I think they're possibly going to help make the film. Once again, as a cameraman, 
uh, you have to go into the pre-production of a film um, with, I think, an open mind because, uh, you know, a lot of cameramen tended to have a style of shooting and they took that from film to film to film. And I looked at that and I thought, no, I don't agree with that. Every script's different. It's set in a different era or a time or geography or whatever, different country to different emotion. You, you need to go into it with an open mind to shoot that film, not bring the photography of the last one to this one. I disagreed with that. So I always used to, as Sidney Pollock said, you, do, you don't talk much, but I listen and try to work out exactly how they want to go. George's Fury Road, because of the stunts and the choreography of those stunts, everything had to be really pinned down. The Perfect Storm uh, in America with Wolfgang Peterson, same. Very heavily storyboarded because of the, the visual effects and uh, post work that had to go on. And then other films like Rain Man, no, nothing. We just went out and shot it. So every film is different. And I feel that, you know, our approach has to be very open-minded about each film. And that's what you have to learn as a cameraman to, I think, be able to handle a director to shoot their film, but you enhance, you do your job, and it all becomes a mellifluous sort of understanding between you all that, that makes it work. Because that's what you're there for, is to make the movie worth 